and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Call our meeting to order, and I'm going to ask you that do what I didn't do yet, silence your cell phone. Uh, if you need a listening device, they're available. Just ask one of the county staff. And all meeting documents are on the end by Commissioner Heiberger, and they are also available in the county auditor's office anytime during normal business hours. Um, look for a motion to approve our agenda. <coughs> so moved. Second, Second, Jeff. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Oppose, same sign, motion carries. I'm gonna look for nominations for the commission chairperson for 2022. I make a motion to uh, appoint Commissioner Heiberger as the chair. Second, Benninga. Call the roll. Bart. Aye. Thunder. Aye. Benninga. Aye. Heiberger. Aye. Persky. Aye, motion carries. We're gonna play musical chairs right now. Uh, in between chairmen, I'd just like to make a comment. Uh, we're doing something a little bit different today where we have a consent agenda which uh, expedites this meeting. And so a number of items that we normally used to uh, approve routinely are actually now so routine that they're in the consent agenda. So it's a little bit different than it has been for uh, since the creation of the commission. Thank you, Commissioner Barth. Um, we will move on to, thank you. Mm -hmm. We will move on to selection of the vice chair. Is there a motion? I'd like to make a motion to um, elect Gene Bender as vice chairperson. I'll second that. I have a motion and a second to nominate Gene Bender as the vice chair. Roll call vote. Bender. Aye. Benega. Aye. Persky. Aye. Barth. Aye. Heiberger. Aye. Motion passes unanimously. Item number five is de designation of the official county newspaper for 2022. Uh, Tyler. Good morning, Tyler Flat, Commission Office. Uh, for you today, in accordance with South Dakota codified law 718.3, the commission must designate three or more legal newspapers in the county <laughs> at its first regular meeting in January. For 2021, these newspapers have been the Argus Leader, Brandon Valley Journal, <coughs> Garrison Gazette, and the Minnehaha Messenger. For 2022, proposals were received from the Argus Leader, Brandon Valley Journal, Garrison Gazette, and the Minnehaha Messenger. And those rates and their circulation are there for your information as well. I would ask if any of those newspapers are here and would like to speak to the commission before we make a decision. It's up to you. You just identify yourself and your paper. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, Garrick Moritz, editor and owner of the Garrison Gazette. Um, had a great relationship with you guys the last, uh, oh, I don't know how many years now. So hope to continue it. Um, and that's all. If you have any questions, you know how to get a hold of me. Okay, thanks, Garrick. <laughs> Is there anyone else that wants to speak on behalf of their newspaper? Good morning, Jill Meyer with the Brandon Valley Journal. Um, we are in our fifth year of publication and your support has just been amazing for us. Um, we hope to continue this working arrangement. As you can see, we've had Dave Baumeister here the past five years now. Um, he probably has attendance better than some of our commissioners, unfortunately, <laughs> but does. fortunately. Um, so just believe that, or please believe that we believe in what you're doing and we appreciate your support and would hope that you would want to continue on with the four newspaper designation. Thanks, Joe. Anyone else? Yep, got another one. Hello, thank you for having us here today. I'm Lisa with the Minnehaha Messenger. I'm with New Century Press, we're the corporate for them. I wanna thank you for all your support you've given us already. We just took over the Messenger as well by our second year, and we appreciate everything that you've done. Um, we're very happy also to have Dave, he writes for us and he's published every week. So I hope you continue to support community newspapers also. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? We have one more paper. Not seeing anything, um, Commission? Madam Chair, we have a uh, representative from the Argus. I don't know if she wants to say anything. <laughs> Hi, my name is Nicole Kai. Um, I am a reporter with the Argus Leader. 
Um, I'm only four to five months new to Sioux Falls, so I'm a New York native, but um, we actually just closed our press that ran for over 50 years, and we had to lay off a couple people that ran that incredible press, so um, I've been reporting here for a couple months, and I've been enjoying it, and I thank you guys for having me, and I hope you guys know that we have the support of the Argus Theater as well. Uh, thanks, Nicole. Commission? Madam Chair, I'd make a motion to approve uh, these four newspapers to be our legal uh, uh, county newspapers. Is there a second? Or I'd second that comments? motion. I have a motion and uh, a second. There are any additional comments? Jeff? I would just say that I do appreciate, uh, uh, you know, uh, Dave Baumeister coming, and I do, uh, I'm happy to have Nicole also come. Uh, the, uh, I now subscribe to all four of those papers, and there is so much good information uh, in going through all of them. Uh, I'd recommend it to all of you, I, if you don't already, and uh, thank you. And I would, uh, we do have a motion and a second to approve all four. We'd also note that, and this was mentioned before, that we only have to approve three, but we recognize the importance of having those um, community papers in their communities, and they are good information. I, I get one of them, um, and it, it, it's a good circulation. So I have a motion and a second. There will be a roll call vote. Bart. Aye. Bender. Aye. Benega. Aye. Karski. Aye. Heiberger. Aye. Motion passes unanimously. Item number six is appointment of Steve Grone as the Minnehaha County Highway Superintendent for 20, 2022 and 2023, through 2023. Good morning, Commissioners. Carol Muller. Um, one of the things that SDCL requires is that the a County Highway Superintendent be appointed for a two-year term. So we worked to get him on a schedule, just hiring him a few months ago, but to work to get him on a schedule. So we've, it comes up at the same time every year. So you will not see this action again until 2024, the first meeting. Thank you. Okay. Any questions for Carol? Motion? <laughs> I'd make a motion to approve Steve Grona as a county highway superintendent for 2022-2023. I'd make a second with a comment. Commissioner Karski? Since Steve started, what, July? Okay, close. Um, I've received numerous texts and emails from various counterparts, peers of Steve that the city and the state level, and I'm just appreciating the work he does, the open communication, and just the outstanding guy that he is. So we appreciate you, Steve. Thank you. I see Ned's heads nodding in the in the audience too, Steve. So thank you very much. I have a motion and a second to approve the next two years. Roll call vote. Benega? Aye. Kersky? Aye. Bart? Aye. Bender? Aye. Heiberger? Motion. Aye. Motion passes unanimously. Item number seven is record non-elected department heads for 2022. Carol Muller? <clears throat> Good morning, Commissioners. Carol Muller, Commission Office. Uh, once a year, we do this as a routine thing, so that uh, matter of interest for people who want to know um, who are in what positions, and this is who we'll have for the next year. So we would just ask that, um, can you scroll down just a bit, Trish? No, up, I'm sorry. Um, yes, consider a motion to direct that the following are recorded as non-elected department heads. <clears throat> just a recording, so there's no motion on this. Item number eight is the Minnehaha County Corner Apartment for 2022. Carol Muller. Uh, yes, action requested today is consider a resolution to appoint Dr. Kenneth Snell as Minneapolis County Coroner. Uh, this is something that's required to do every year, and uh, you did a contract. We renewed the contract with Sanford for the coroner services, and this is just specifically a resolution appointing the coroner at the first meeting of the year for a term of one year. Any questions for Carol? Look for a motion. Motion to approve. Second. And rope call vote. Bender? Aye. Barr? Aye. Benega? Aye. Karski? Aye. Heiberger? Aye. Motion passes unanimously. Item number nine is established 2022 salaries for Minnehaha County Commissioners. Good Girl morning, Miller. Commissioners, again. Yes, this is the last item that we have on our agenda today that uh, we do on an annual basis per state law. Um, 
we require the Board of County Commissioners to establish their salary at the first regular meeting of the year. If you fail to determine a salary, then the salary is set by statute, which would be $7,233. Um, for the background, in 2021, commissioners who are all part-time and do not receive any benefits as part of this were paid $29,765.32. You have two resolutions in front of you, one at 3% and one at 5% for your consideration. 3% uh, would result in a salary of $30,659.20. A 5% salary adjustment would result in a salary of $31,262.40. Some people listening may say, why is that a really odd number? And the reason for that is because those numbers need to be div divisible by 26, which is the number of pay periods in a year. So we end up with an odd dollar amount. On top of that, the chairperson receives approximately $1,500 extra in recognition of the work that they do as chair. Thanks, Carol. Questions for Carol? Motions? We discussed this last week um, in a briefing. Well, I'd make a motion for a 5% uh, increase for the county commissioners, and then I would have a comment. And I'd second it with also a comment. Commissioner Barth first. Commissioner so Barth. the majority of our uh, employees in the county are still in progression on their way to top pay. But those in progression will not only get their 3% raise that we've put in our budget, <coughs> but they'll get their step increase of 2.5%. So they're going to get a 5.5% uh, raise going forward. At the same time, uh, uh, we, uh, we originally budgeted 2.5% and found some savings and were able to increase it to 3%. And I look forward to finding ways to also uh, increase pay for our county employees. Commissioner Karski? Um, second what Commissioner Barth said on the, you know, 83 percent of the county employees will receive a five and a half percent raise over the course of the year with the COLA and their step increases. Um, and all of us except for Commissioner Barth are full-time employed so our time is pretty much worth mar money, but I don't know what the time of a retired individual is worth. But <laughs> my point is that you know, to be here takes time away from my business and my schedule, and my time is worth some money. And it, we are under the public um, scrutiny of, for the things that we do. And um, we need to get good, qualified people that want to run. We have elections this year, every other year, and just to get keep people interested in this job um, for the scrutiny that it involves, I think, is worth money for the time committed. Madam Chair, Commissioner Burke. Um, let me say that uh, having worked 31 years at the telephone company now known as Lumen, uh, CenturyLink, uh, Quest, uh, US West, I get a, a pension every month. Plus, I have of such advanced age that I get Social Security. <laughs> and additionally, I, uh, I have a couple other side gigs that I do, but the stock market has been blessing me w by uh, helicoptering loads of money over my house and <laughs> dropping it. Uh, uh, don't give out my address. Um, thank you. We have a motion to second. I will say that I also do not have a full-time job, but I can't say that I'm retired. I'm still plenty busy. Um, last week I advocated for the 3% raise. I will go along with my, um, my fellow commissioners, 5%. It is less than the 5.5%, and by, for reasons that they have all stated, I will um, support what they said. So roll call vote. Barth. Aye. Karski. Aye. Bender. Aye. Seneca. Aye. Hi, Berger. Aye. Motion passes <coughs> unanimously. And now we're going to move on to some of the new things. I'll just point out, or not maybe point out, but the commission has a new um, platform that we're using now called Civic Plus. And so if you see us scrambling because we're confused, we have a whole new platform on our iPads that we're dealing with that we just started this week. Um, so far, so good. Hopefully it won't um, go down on me in the middle of the meeting because I have a long password to get back in. And then also, as um, Commissioner Barth mentioned, there was a consent agenda. I'm gonna read a little bit of information about the consent agenda. I will do this one, maybe two weeks, just for the benefit of the people in the audience and the benefit of the people on TV so they know what we're doing. After that, we will just 
strictly go into the consent agenda without an explanation from the chair. So the, um, the, and the consent agenda, the Board of Commissioner uses a consent agenda to act on routine items. The consent agenda is acted upon by one motion and the vote of the board. Items may be removed from the consent agenda and placed on the regular agenda at the request of a board member or member of the public. Such items will be moved to the bottom of the agenda preceding the liaison report. Would anyone like to remove an item from the consent agenda at this point? And I'm going to tell you what the consent agenda is before we make a motion on it too, just for the next couple of weeks so people are aware of what they are. So consent agenda items um, number 10 are A, approval of the commission minute, meeting minutes from December 28, 2021, paying of the bills of $1,267,866.82. There are no reports. Item D is personnel, routine personnel action. Item E is abatement applications um, for approval. There are none this week. Item F is notice and requests. There are none. Item G is previously discussed items on policy guidelines. There are none. Item H is non-controversial resolutions. And under that item H, there are two this week, which is approval of a resolution that establishes reduced legal load limits on structure 21 structures, adding 50-324-170. And item two of, of item H is establishing appointments to the Minnehaha Lincoln County Board of Mental Illness and the Minnehaha County Review Board for Developmental Di Disabilities. So that's what's on our consent agenda and that's what will be on there from going forward. So now I would ask for an, a motion from the commission to approve the consent agenda. That's my motion. Second. I have a motion and a second. All those in favor, roll call vote. Harsky. Aye. Clark. Aye. Benica. Aye. Fender. Aye. Heiberger. Aye. Motion passes unanimously. Next, we'll move on to public comment. This is an opportunity for you to speak on something that is not on today's agenda. We ask you to limit your um, your comments to five minutes, and the commission does not routinely. Um, comment on what your comments are because this is not on a regular agenda. So is there anyone that would like to have public comment? Good morning, commissioners. Uh, my name is Ryan Solberg and I work with the Sioux Metro Growth Alliance, uh, formerly Lincoln County and Minnehaha County Economic Development Associations. Um, as all of you know, we serve the rural economic development interests of uh, Minnehaha and Lincoln counties and also now McCook County. Um, the wonderful city of Salem has joined our organization for 2022. I'm an economic development specialist with the Sioux Metro Growth Alliance, part of our new management service. Uh, so I'm employed by the Sioux Metro Growth Alliance and I am contracted back out uh, to one of our 13, now 14 with Salem, member communities who cannot afford their own full-time or even part-time staff person to focus um, solely on economic development. Um, I've been in the position for about nine months. Uh, I started off with uh, Lennox down in Lincoln County and I've been with uh, the city of Baltic here in Minnehaha County for the last three months. Um, so I'm looking forward to learning more about Minnehaha County and, and working with you to help this, this part of the world prosper. Um, in our roles as economic development specialists, um, we're focusing a lot on those traditional measures of economic development success, which would be growing sales tax base, property tax base, uh, better employment numbers, more rooftops. Um, but we're also trying to be more holistic in our approach to economic development and focusing on some of those community development aspects, telling the story of our communities to potential residents and businesses, engaging residents in their community, uh, and much more. And I wanted, so we wanted to take the time today to introduce ourselves, as me and my, my colleague here will both be working in Minnehaha County. And he's new to the job. This is his second day, so I'll let him introduce him, himself and uh, get a little public speaking experience. <laughs> Um, yeah, thank you for your time, Commissioners. I'm Sheldon Jensen, a recent graduate of the wonderful University of Augustana University, um, and uh, I am working with Dell Rapids and Salem with the Sumatra Growth Alliance, and uh, we are excited for what we can do in 2022 and beyond. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Ryan and Sheldon, for coming. Is there anybody else for public comment? Okay, with that, we'll move on to regular agenda. Item number 11 is a motion to declare certain sheriff office vehicles as surplus property and authorize the commission to sign the resolution for gratuitous transfers of vehicles to Southeast Technical College and the Sioux Empire Fair Association. Joe Bosman. Good morning, Joe. Good morning, Commissioners. Joe Bosman with the Sheriff's Office. This morning I have in front of you an item that is requesting three vehicles be surplused and given to Southeast Tech College and the Sioux Empire Fair. Uh, we, at the end of our vehicle lives, 
uh, offer them to other nonprofits and departments throughout the county. And as such, these two places have indicated they would like to, some use out of these vehicles. And so with your request, then that we would then transfer ownership of these vehicles to uh, the Southeast Tech, which they could use for their law enforcement program, as well as our contract law enforcement services we provide out there. Okay. Thanks, Joe. Any questions for Joe? Motion? That's my motion to transfer these vehicles. Second. I have a motion and a second. Roll call vote. Hersky. Aye. Barth. Aye. Bender. Aye. Fenega. Aye. Heiberger. Aye. Motion passes unanimously. Yep. Thank you. Item number 12 is authorize the chairman to sign the annual lease agreements with the Sioux Valley Geological Society and Minnehaha County Historical Society, Bill Hoskins. Good morning, Bill. Happy New Year. <laughs> Happy New Year. Uh, Bill Hoskins, director of the Sioux Land Heritage Museum. These are two annual leases, one with the Sioux Valley Genealogical Society, um, which has offices on the second floor of the Old Courthouse Museum, the other with the S Minnehaha County Historical Society. Um, these are leases that we do on an annual basis. Uh, they do require a unanimous vote of the commission for approval. Uh, the leases have been uh, reviewed by the state's attorney's office, and I would request you authorize the chairman to sign the leases. Any questions for Bill? I would ask, oh, do you have a question? I was gonna just ask, um, ask him to point out, uh, Bill, these organizations also help you at the museum, don't they? They take guests and tell them, you know, <clears throat> where to go. <laughs> yeah, the, the Sioux Valley Genealogical Society, uh, their library is open for public researchers on a on a Monday through Friday basis. They have a monthly meeting with an informational program that's open to the public. The Minnehaha County Historical Society also has a monthly meeting that takes place at the Old Courthouse Museum that has uh, that's open to the general public. And the genealogical folks are also the majority of them on the Abandoned Cemeteries Board. Uh, I, I believe that many of them share memberships. Okay. Any other questions for Bill? We will need two motions on this, so I would take the first motion to authorize the um, Sioux Valley Genealogical Society. That's my motion. Second. I have a motion and a second. Roll call vote. Barth. Aye. Bender. Aye. Benega. Aye. Harsky. Aye. Heiberger. Aye. Motion passes unanimously. And the next one is for the lease with um, Minnehaha County Historical Society and the county. Roll call vote. Make a motion to. Um, Wait. Second. I have a motion and Whatever a second. Whatever she said. And now a roll call vote. <laughs> Bender. Aye. Barth. Aye. Benega. Aye. Hersky. Aye. Heiberger. Aye. Motion passes unanimously. Thanks, Bill. Item number 13 is a resolution to approve as assignment of the certificate of tax sale pursuant to the demands by the city of Humboldt. Chris. Morning, Good morning, Commissioners. Chris. Chris Watson, County Treasurer. So uh, Minnehaha County holds a certificate of tax sale for a property located in the city of Humboldt. Um, the city of Humboldt has passed a resolution seeking an assignment by the county of the certificate tax sale. Um, now the city of Humboldt has paid their, they did come in and pay the delinquent amount of $131,190.18. And that will need to be assessed out. Um, but the majority of the amount owed on the tax certificate is a result of two special assessments which the city of Humboldt held. Um, so what we are asking is the approval of the attached resolution which grants approval to the treasurer's execution of the assignment of certificate of tax sale number 408 to the city of Humboldt. Okay. Any questions for Chris on this? I'd look for a motion. I make a motion, Beninga. Second, Bender. Roll call vote. Beninga. Aye. Bender. Aye. Barth. Aye. Hersky. Aye. Heiberger. Aye. Motion passes unanimously. Thanks, Chris. Item number 14 is a resolution to establish the rates for indigent burial assistance. Lori Montes. Good morning, Commission. Lori Montes, Human Services, here seeking um, authorization by the chair to sign a resolution to increase our burial assistance rates. At Human Services, we provide assistance for those 
in need um, of assistance in paying for final costs for um, loss of loved ones. And so we had a conversation in June with the funeral home directors, um, the local ones, and um, made a um, plan to put into our budget for an increase. And so we're looking at increasing from 2,000 for cremations and 3,000 for traditional burials to 2,000 for cremations. That would stay the same. Increasing to 2,500 for cremation plus memorial service, which is really a separate service from just cremations. And then um, up to 3,500 for traditional funerals. Any questions for Lori? Commissioner Berg. Um, Lori, how many uh, indigent do we uh, take responsibility for? Uh, as we know, uh, we don't leave uh, deceased folks laying around town, uh, something has to be done with them and no one will take care of them if the county doesn't. Right, um, 2020 we had 117. Um, I'm not sure, we had similar for, for last year. I don't have the final number now from 2021, but it's been about that amount. And so um, that, increases if slightly. I may, Madam Chair, at, at $1,500 to $2,000 a piece, 117 is quite a bit of cost to us. Sure, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And this increase, our um, guesstimate based on um, funerals that we have approved previously is that it will be a $34,500 increase in our budget line item for funeral assistance. Commissioner Kersky. Unless things have changed, Laurie, just, I'm just refreshing my memory here. Tell me if I'm incorrect. But there's a state statute that, I mean, we do 2,000 for direct cremation and 2,500 and 3,500. So if somebody comes to us and says, you know, Uncle Joe passed and he had no family, would the county take care of him? We can't just say yes. The only thing we do is a cremation. They still have the option of saying we would like this type of a burial. So they can opt for the higher ones. It's not our decision. Is that correct? Still correct? That is correct. Yes. Okay. The family gets to decide. Any additional comment? Commissioner Burke? You know, at one point we did go to the legislature and ask for permission to cremate all of the, the folks because it would be a savings to us. And the legislature suggested that it might be against the religion of the decedent to be cremated. Of course, their brothers and sisters could come and get him or her, but, uh, and they also said it's just a Sioux Falls or Minnehaha problem, and uh, it's, uh, we have done a better job of making sure the family truly is indigent. So just because the, the nephew here in town has no money doesn't mean that uh, his sister doesn't own a tanker farm in Florida or something. And uh, right. we have cut down uh, quite a bit on the number of uh, folks that we uh, cover, but it's still a large expense and the legislature should pay attention. I don't think we have a motion and a second on this one yet. Move approval of the rates as set. I have a motion and a second. And I will say uh, a thank you to the funeral homes because um, we all know funerals cost more than the amount of money that the county is spending on these funerals. And um, when somebody comes in in tremendous grief and they are indigent and they have nothing to do, they fall back on us. And um, the funeral homes have very graciously helped us out. We couldn't do this without them, obviously. And um, they service those, those families who are grieving too. So it is super important that we have professional people that are taking care of these grieving families. So I have a motion and a, a second, and we'll ask for roll call vote. Kersky. Aye. Clark? Aye. Benigo? Aye. Bender? Aye. Heiberger? Aye. Motion passes unanimously. Item number 15 is a bid results and award recommendations for Minnehaha County 17-10 Highway 149 construction. Jacob. Good morning, Commissioners. <clears throat> uh, December 16th, we had the County Highway 149 reconstruction job bid. Um, prices came in considerably higher than what we expected. <clears throat> we would propose um, re-looking at this project, reducing the scope, um, but still, still trying to meet our safety improvement goals on this stretch of roadway. It was originally identified due to unsafe in slopes and some and some hills where there's unsafe sight distance. So. We'd still like to pursue those goals, but would like to go about it in a different manner. Are there any questions for Jacob? Commissioner Bender. I'm just confirming what, what you need is a motion to reject all the bids. Yep, motion to reject all bids. That's my motion. Second. I have a motion and a second to reject all bids. Any additional comments? 
Roll call vote, please. Bender. Aye. Barth. Aye. Hersky. Aye. Benega. Aye. Heiberger. Aye. Motion <laughs> passes unanimously. Thanks, Jacob. Thank you. Item number 16 is a briefing on the prosecution system comparison report by Barry Dunn. Um, Dunn. Actually, commissioners, I'm going to ask you to move this farther down on the agenda because uh, they're set up for closer to 10 o'clock. They're on different time zones okay. and working on stuff. So we would, I would ask that you bump okay. that down a ways. Um, we've got set up 17, 18, 19, and 20, and uh, 22, which will just leave the two major items. With consent agenda, we're clipping faster than I thought we would. Yeah. Okay, Thank you. I will. I, you might have to motion to me. I wrote it on my paper. So, um, item number 17 is consider a resolution for rate of pay, facility rentals, and mileage reimbursement for the 2022 election cycle. Ben. Yes, good morning, Commissioners. Uh, ben Kite, Auditor's Office. Um, so, on an annual basis, uh, uh, at this time every year, we're required to um, get approvals for the election worker rate of pay. Um, we've you know, discussed the rate of pay with our HR area, uh, area just to make sure we're somewhat competitive. Um, so we're uh, suggesting a uh, rate of pay that's in the resolution of, of $15 an hour basically for most election workers, uh, a little bit more for the uh, precinct superintendents, and then we have just a uh, rate for other mileage and phone usage. So we'd look for your approval on that. Resolution. Any questions for Ben? Is there an election year or promotion? I'd make a motion. Go ahead. M make a motion to uh, approve the rates of pay and the rental f uh, reimbursements and mileage reimbursements for 2022 election. I'll second. I would like to yep. make I a comment. A motion and a second with a comment from Commissioner Barth. Um, Auditor uh, Kite, isn't it true that? It's, uh, we're always looking for help to run these elections because, you know, there has been certainly a withdrawal of quite a few folks that were octogenarians during this time of illness uh, from participating, uh, helping us. That's true, Commissioner. We always struggle to um, get the number of workers that we need to help us in, through the election process. Thank you. I have a motion and a second. All those are, excuse me, roll call vote. Senator? Aye. Aye. Bender? Aye. Hersky? Aye. Heiberger? Aye. Motion passes unanimously. Thanks, Ben. You're welcome. Uh, if uh, I could, oh, one quick good. question, yep, Chair. Sure. Go ahead. What, were, what was the hourly pay last year, Ben? Um, I, it was close to this. I think it was less, you know, like $13, $14 an hour. We've bumped it up to $15 an hour, which I would consider kind of the, the, the unofficial uh, minimum wage within um, the uh, county. but. Uh, yeah, it's, it's up somewhat. Okay. Uh, we, we had to be careful. We, we have some rate, uh, salary rates within the county, too, that we didn't want to, you know, exceed. So uh, that kind of addresses this as well. Okay. Thank you. Apologize. And, and Ben has several more here, so we'll con I just turned page. Um, item number 18 is consider a motion to approve the City of Sioux Falls precinct number changes. Yes. Um, so the, the City of uh, Sioux Falls has um, redistricted redistricted their um, council wards, I guess is maybe the right term. Um, and we've, they've tried to keep the, the, the numbering system um, kind of consistent with the, the Minneapolis County uh, um, election process. So they have um, made some uh, updates. You know, it doesn't change the, uh, the recommendation does not, not change the boundaries of, of any of our precincts. It just, the uh, the number that we associate with them. So, for example, um, there used to be precinct one three changed to three one. So that particular precinct was in ward number one. It's now moved to ward number three. All right. Hopefully, and I think you may have you have the map there in front of you. So we highlighted the um, the ward number changes. Um, this, the, the precinct locations don't change, the boundaries don't change, it's just the, the number that we associate with them uh, is changed. And then this, this helps uh, kind of, uh, for the voters really, uh, make sure they understand where they're at, we're voting for on a city election. Um, the city did pass this ordinance that goes into effect uh, January 7th. Okay, any questions for Ben? Look for a motion. 
Move for approval. Ben and Second. Gay. Motion and second. This has already been approved by the city of Sioux Falls, and we do not need a roll call vote. So all those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Motion passes unanimously. Item number 19 is consider a resolution establishing record of the 2022 Minnehaha County designated polling places. Ben. Yes. So uh, South Dakota Codify Law 12-12-1 uh, and 12 dash 14-1 require the auditor to give notice of the uh, polling places on an annual basis. So um, I have a resolution that presents those. Now I've incorporated in this resolution for everybody's reference uh, the, the change in the, in the numbering system uh, from the city. So you can see where uh, precinct 1-19 was previously um, noted as 5-1. 11 um, the location hasn't changed um, but we had like I think there was uh, six of these uh, name changes that we just approved through that motion uh, again the location doesn't change we've actually only had two locations that we've had to to change um, so this year so previously in 1-17 uh, that uh, was the Sanford Health facility on West 41st Street uh, they no, no longer um, wanted to be a precinct and needed to uh, use their space, so they asked um, for us to find another location. So we have joined with the Sioux Falls First Church, um, which is close to that location. They'll, they'll serve as a, a precinct for 1-17 uh, along with 1-10. Uh, and then um, the Ronning Library branch on 41st and Southeastern uh, will be under construction um, this year. So they've asked us to find another location for this year until that construction is completed. Um, so uh, the Southern Hills United Methodist Church, which is right next door to the Ronnie Library, has agreed to um, serve as a uh, precinct location for us, um, at least for this year. And um, so th that's the only location changes. The rest of them are just numbering changes. Everybody else at this point has agreed to uh, continue to be a precinct um, for us, um, that's another area that's always a challenge for us in the elections is finding a, uh, a voting location. Um, you know, people have concerns about uh, various things, whether it's health concerns or security concerns. Uh, and so we're always having to work very closely with uh, all of these um, polling locations to make sure they're, they're comfortable. Uh, we've been out and tried to visit most of the, them in Sioux Falls and the rural areas just to, to meet them and you know see if they've had any concerns so um, you know this is the uh, I think a lot of work but I think it, uh, we've got a good result but I would ask your support on that resolution any questions for Ben I do have a question oh, Commissioner Kersky Ben the uh, city election official is Thomas Greco the city mm -hmm. clerk so city elections, um, state, county, et cetera, are they all going to be in the same locations? I mean, or does the city choose their own? What, what can you tell me about yeah, that? Yeah, so we work very closely with the city, right? So uh, Tom um, Greco and myself and my staff have been working on these locations. We will use the same polling locations for city elections as we do for the county elections. Uh, and uh, even the rural uh, locations are the same. But yes, so we try to make that easier for the voters. So when the city will have an election in uh, April, and then when we have the primaries in um, June and November, they, the voters would continue to go back to their same location, pending, as long as there's no changes from those polling places. Good question. Is that the same with the, the other towns like Hartford, Del Rapids? Yes, so we use the, their same locations, okay. right? Okay. So, but we don't, uh, for those like, uh, uh, Del Rapids, if they had an election, we're not involved with that, uh, helping them, but they use the same locations. Okay. Additional questions? Commissioner Barth? It's more of a comment. I, I really would wish that we had more public buildings used instead of churches. I think that uh, uh, it, it may be off-putting to some folks to have to go to uh, you know, a church or a mosque or a synagogue, whatever, whereas going to a school or uh, a library, I think, is uh, is easier for uh, our voters. But uh, again, we need them all to go vote. I, I agree, Commissioner. Uh, we, um, yeah, if we had the use of the Sioux Falls School District buildings, that would be a great help to us. 
we do try to leverage any community centers that might be attached to those um, uh, schools today, um, just because the city has some ability to help us get access to those. But um, yeah, it would be helpful if we had more public buildings, but that they have concerns like everybody else. Any other comments? I would also like to thank the auditor's office. The elections is a very small part of the total job that the auditor's office does, but the elections are extremely time consuming, and so they put an awful lot of hours into a small portion of what their total job is. So I'd like to thank you, Ben, for that and your staff. You. We um, do have a motion and a second. No? Okay, we don't have a motion and a second, so I would look for a motion. I would make a motion to approve. Second. Motion and a second, and roll call vote. Clark. Aye. Kirsty. Aye. Benega? Aye. Bender? Aye. Heberger? Aye. Motion passes unanimously. And okay. one more. Item number 20 is approved resolution authorizing insurance of debt. So, yes, uh, for non election <laughs> items, this is our request for upcoming debt issuance and refinancing. So, um, back in August of 2020, the county Commission approved issuance of debt up to $25 million to construct a highway shop and a um, remodel our extension building. Uh, we issued $9.8 million back in the, at the end of December to begin that construction. Um, and then we've since, you know, as construction has begun, we've, we've worked with our construction manager at Risk Tegra to uh, give us a better understanding of what the cash flows would be, so we understand what the final cost would be. So we, we've got that. We think that's we'll need about $6.8 million to complete the construction and, uh, of, of the highway shop and the remodel of the extension building. And then through this process, we've also um, reviewed our outstanding debt to see if there's any existing issuances that could be uh, refinanced to a lower rate. Um, and we've identified one issuance, that's the 2010-2010A, which is about a uh, million five eighty five left in principal balance. We think that over, uh, you know, with this refinancing, we'll save about $100,000 in interest over the life of, or of that bond. So uh, we would look to incorporate that. We think we'll have about, um, need to issue about $7.6 in total um, to for the construction cost and that refinancing. Um, and we'd, you know, look to, if the resolution is approved today, we'd probably um, look to uh, price the debt sometime in early um, February and then hopefully settle by the end of, end of February so that we can meet the cash flow needs for the construction projects. So the resolution you have in front of you really is just a reaffirmation of the uh, resolution that you passed back in August of 2020. Uh, it was... Um, put together by our bond council and reviewed by a state's attorney. Um, but yeah, open for any questions you might have. Okay, any questions for Ben? Seeing none, I think we're all well aware of this. I'd look for a motion. I'll make that motion. I'll second that. Motion in a second and a roll call vote. Clark. Aye. Benega? Aye. Bender? Aye. Kirsty? Aye, Berger. Aye, motion passes unanimously. We're going to go back to item number 16. Our vendor is here. Just give me two seconds here. Item number 16 is a briefing on the prosecution system comparison report by Barry Dunn. Carol Muller. Thank you, commissioners. Carol Muller, commission office. And I believe I have two gentlemen from Barry Dunn on the phone, and I see they're popping up on Zoom. So to introduce this, today you're having a briefing on a prosecution system comparison report that was done by Barry Dunn. On July 2021, the Board of Commissioners authorized a contract with Barry Dunn for a comparison analysis of prosecution software. The purpose of the comparison analysis was to review the current application and the prosecutor by Carpel, which we refer to as PBK software. Over the past six months, stakeholders were defined and interviewed, functional requirements of a prosecution system were defined, and Barry Dunn compiled the attached report for your review. And they also have a PowerPoint that they'll be taking through. Um, with us today are Doug Rowe and Alec Letty from Barry Dunn. And uh, they're here joining us by Zoom. I know they're in a different time zone, so I appreciate them working through busy schedules to join us today. So with that, I think we can turn it over to Barry Dunn. All right, thank you. Uh, Doug. Uh, thank you, Carol. 
and, and good morning, commissioners. Um, I, my name's Alec Letty. Uh, I'm a senior consultant at Barry Dunn. Uh, Doug and I, as Carol mentioned, are coming to you from Maine. Um, Doug is a, is a principal. Actually, Doug, why don't I let you, why don't I let you uh, introduce yourself? Sure, good morning, everybody. Um, yeah, my name is Doug Rowe. Uh, I am a principal in charge of Barry Dunn um, Justice and Public Safety Practice within our government consulting group. Um, and along with Alec, uh, we conducted this um, this commissioned analysis, as um, Carol just mentioned. And Alec, I think, is going to walk us through just a few slides that describe, as a summary, um, the results of that, uh, that analysis. Thanks, Doug. Um, Monty, are you guys? Yeah, there it is. Thank you. I, I, I say, Monty, are you driving this, Monty? Or Carol, are you? Uh, he's, he's not driving it, but he is in the room. We have one of his staff here, so he is in the room if you want to talk to him. Okay. No, 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 I don't, I don't need to. I just see his <laughs> name attached to something. Yeah. Um, so as uh, both Carol and Doug mentioned, we were retained by the county uh, last summer um, after the state's attorney's office decided that it uh, wished to uh, update its case management system and got um, a presentation by TDK, which, as Carol mentioned, is a the prosecution case management system put together uh, or offered by a company called Carpel Solutions out of St. Louis, Missouri. Um, we had a project team from the county that we worked with. I, I want to, I do want to let you know who that was mm -hmm. and thank them for their work. Uh, Commissioner Bender, um, Carol Muller, uh, Monty, and then from the state's attorney's office, the state's attorney Daniel Hager, and uh, his one of his assistants, Eric Bogue. Um, we met, I believe, if I remember correctly, it was bi-weekly for about six months. Uh, as as um, Carol briefly mentioned, we uh, identified requirements that would, would be compared. We um, identified people to talk to. We spoke to over 25 people, mostly in the state's attorney's office, but also, um, you can go to the next slide. So this is sort of covering that material. Um, but also the public advocate, the public defender, and folks in Monty's IT shop as well. Um, we were retained to compare just the two systems, your current legacy system in the state's attorney's office and uh, PDK. So following our identification of requirements and our interviews with those 20, I think it was 26 or 20 to 28 people. Um, I think that happened over, well, it says in here, it doesn't, at the end of August, beginning of September. Um, we also did a document request early on and got some documentation of the system. And finally, we got, um, we were given product demonstrations uh, by Monty and his staff of the current system and also um, by PDK. So I think we can go to the next slide. Uh, the, uh, you'll see three columns here. Uh, one kind of lists general categories of material or items that we reviewed and looked at. The second middle column is the current prosecution case management system. That's what PCMS stands for. And then the third column, the last one is PDK. Uh, as you can see, uh, I'll start with PDK. PDK is a commercial off the shelf system. Uh, it is in, I believe over 30 states has many, many thousands of users. I think it's something like over 12,000 the last time I checked. Um, and it's a well-respected, um, you know, secure cloud-based case management system in use by prosecutors around the country. Uh, your current system, the legacy system, was written by your local IT shop. It offers significant uh, benefits. It also has some um, some weaknesses. And if we go to the next slide, I think we'll, I think we're going to start with um, the case management. Yeah, your current system on the left there, the strengths. Uh, discovery is worth mentioning because the, because one IT shop runs one system for all county users. And this, and I'm, when I say all county users, what I mean in this case is um, 
the public advocate and the public defender and the and the state's attorney's office because they're all in the same system discovery sharing between those three offices which is a significant portion of all of their work is it is made pretty seamless and uh and pretty easy for the users both the public advocate and the public defender in particular were um uh, expressed a great deal of satisfaction with the current system and in, in that respect um it offers a great customizability uh your local you know your local it staff can can write new new pieces if you need it um that has a flip side and that is because of uh, staffing issues you know true of all uh, pretty much any it shop will tell you they're overworked so um, it sometimes takes quite a while for them to get to items that that need need attention um, and finally it, it costs um, these are folks that are already on your payroll um, and Monty and his shop are storing data on uh, external hard drives which is very inexpensive uh, all things considered um, you can see there on the right some of the weaknesses that we uh, that, that were shared with us by users. Um, there definitely was a lot of uh, complaints about free, the system freezing and crashing. Um, reports, these are things that people, you know, for data, basically finding data and using data to run reports that are either required by the state or the county or that uh, managers just need to help them run the office. Um, they struggle with that in the current system. Um, most of the users in the state's attorney's office are not fully using the current system. Most of the users don't trust it. That's kind of the bottom line. Um, and there are lots of reasons for that. I think a lot of them have predate your current state's attorney. Uh, there was not a focus or an effort to make the, the office paperless, and therefore it wasn't, it didn't happen. Uh, that's it's all. It's a burden to do that. It, it, it's a big job, as I'm sure all of you are familiar from your own lives and your own work. Um, it, it, it takes a lot of effort, a lot of time, and it, it takes a lot of leadership. And those things have not existed in the past to the extent that it would have required to turn that office into a paperless office with the current system. Uh, we did hear a fair number of complaints about calendaring too that's why that's on there in particular um, okay let's go to the next slide so PBK is as I mentioned a commercial off-the-shelf system it is robust it's secure uh, it's advanced it would do everything that the state's attorney's office needs it to do there's no question that the office would likely have to change some of its current business practices that's true of any commercial off-the-shelf system that you buy, whether for your home life or your work life. Uh, it just is not as customizable, and um, but that doesn't mean it doesn't work. It just means you might have to do your work a little bit differently. There's a great deal of interest and excitement in the state's attorney's office to have a paperless updated electronic case management system. Um, almost everybody we spoke to very much wants to move in that direction. You can see the weaknesses that I just mentioned, the customizability and, and cost. Uh, we were not tasked with looking at cost as part of our comparison report. So that's not something that we analyzed. That being said, uh, I, I believe the state's attorney's office if I remember correctly, back in April when they had a demonstration, they did get a quote. I don't know what that quote was, um, but it's not cheap um, to, to move into this system. Um, and that's obviously the functionality and the, it also will provide um, probably a better interface for, for um, public and for other justice partners as well. In other words, the prosecutor's office going into the court system and getting the information it needs sharing information with the, the sheriff's office, uh, other public safety offices. Um, okay, next slide. All right, so that's sort of my, that's kind of
kind of a, a 10,000 foot view of our uh, project and our what we reported to the project team uh, about six weeks ago, I think. Um, and so if folks want to discuss or ask questions, I'll, I'll open the floor to that and have, ask Doug to participate as well. Okay. Thanks, Alec, for that um, presentation. Commissioners, questions for either Alec or Doug? Bender? Well, I, I have kind of a comment, and then I might ask Monty to come forward because we've done some additional uh, work on this after uh, Barry Dunn made their presentation. But I do really want to thank Doug and Alec. And you guys were really helpful in setting out the process for us to kind of take a hard look. I think that we all know that any change in technology has um, has pros and cons. I mean, there's just always, there's nothing that's going to be perfect. And um, any change requires a lot of commitment. And we just really wanted to know what we didn't know. We didn't want to walk into it blind. We wanted to understand um, what, you know, what those you know, pros and cons might be. Um, I think one of the things that um, our IT department, and particularly Monty, had helped us identify early on was that um, a switch to PBK may um, have uh, make that interface that Alec talked about early on um, more difficult with the um, Public Advocate's Office and the Public Defender's Office, and we've had a couple of opportunities to, to visit with the the heads of those offices offline. And Monty, if you wouldn't mind coming forward and just help, helping us understand some of the things that you've been able to learn about um, options to, to make that um, sharing of information similar to what we have right now. Sure. Good morning, Commissioners. Monty Wannenbach, Minnehaha County IT Department. Um, so as the, the report uh, mentioned, and as, as I kind of was concerned about early on in this process was, how this would affect other offices, specifically public defender, public advocate. Um, <clears throat> and while this uh, project didn't completely um, identify and get into the details with the interfaces, um, we had a subgroup, um, Jean Carroll and myself, that met with PBK to discuss those concerns and talk about how we could create an interface so we could um, seamlessly provide those documents over to the public defenders and public advocates office. How do we go about doing this without increasing their workload? If this is better for state's attorney, how do we make sure that we're not um, having a negative impact on those other offices? Um, that was um, a great meeting. I wish it would have happened earlier. Uh, but during that meeting, it was identified that um, an interface could be created that would pull those documents out of the the PBK system, um, if we choose to go that direction, and put those into the public defender and public advocates systems. Um, I have a pretty uh, reasonable level of confidence that that interface will work. Um, these interfaces are always a little bit risky, uh, but one thing that we can do to minimize that risk um, is we can go through a process with the PBK, they call it um, an interface um, form or an interface document where their technical folks get involved and understand um, what we're looking to do and, um, and basically we can define how that interface is, is going to work before we, we make a full commitment. Um, so I think that uh, will help keep our risks um, down and help us identify how that's going to work. Thanks, Monty. Additional questions? Commissioner Bender. Just to follow up, I mean, you had an opportunity to visit not just with PBK, but with an actual end user that's doing something yes, similar, correct? Yes, thank you. Yes, thank you. So they, um, PBK has a customer, a large customer up in the cities um, that is doing this exact same thing from PBK to another system. And so they're using an interface similar to what we're requesting. Um, and she spoke highly of it, said it, it works well from, from her perspective. Um, so I think it was uh, reassuring seeing another customer using that same interface. Okay. And I, I do have one more comment on the storage piece of this that I, I want to clarify. Um, so there's kind of some comments about storage costs and whatnot. Those are really surrounding the video evidence, right? So video evidence takes up a large amount of storage. 
Um, I could tell you in numbers, but um, it's, it's kind of irrelevant. It's very large, take my word for it. Um, so the video evidence and how we're going to manage that um, is something that we're working through with another committee as well, because again, it's kind of outside of the scope of this. Um, so we're gonna continue to work through that. And at this point, it doesn't appear that we're gonna use PBK for, for video evidence. It appears that we're gonna continue to use our existing system, but we'll continue to work through that. So regardless of, of what we do for case management, that video will be handled um, separately. Maybe at some point it will be in PBK. At this point, it doesn't look like it, but I wouldn't be concerned about the, the costs that were mentioned related to storage. You would that or wouldn't? I would not okay, at this point you. because that's something that we're addressing separately. Okay. And if at, down the road we choose to store video in you know, a, a cloud vendor solution that's gonna have a cost, I think we'll, we'll work with that separately. Um, <clears throat> and as far as storing, the, storing data externally in hard drives, I just wanna add, that's for archive data. We keep all videos that the state's attorney deems as, as evidence and, and um, downloads into our system. We keep that video evidence forever. And the only way we can cost effectively um, do that is by taking the video that is no longer needed because the case has been closed. We take that video evidence that's probably not going to be needed, but maybe in the case of an appeal or who knows what, we take that video evidence and we put it to external cold storage and we keep that video for forever. That allows us to dramatically keep um, dramatically reduce those storage costs. So I'm, I'm not concerned about that, um, that item as it, as it was mentioned in this report. Thank you. Is there additional questions for Alec or Doug or Monty? Uh, Commissioner Kersky? A lot of thoughts in my mind, so I'm gonna try to make a word salad a little bit comprehensible here, but Chair of the Public Defender Advisory Board, and we hear from the Public Defender the concerns that you have addressed, and you know the presentation said it's really not customizable, but you're saying that you can, at one level, customize it. You're you're comfortable with that? Well, so what uh, Barry Dunn meant by that is the PBK software is. Um, not customizable, right? Mm -hmm. So their software is what it is. You can put in feature requests, um, but that's uh, a bigger process, right? Yeah. Um, what I was referring to is more the interfaces. So that's a, a separate piece that we'll pay for where we will engage with PBK and we'll say, we want to export documents, um, certain case details, out of your system so we can do what we need to with them in the public defender system. Okay. Alec, did you have something to add to that? I just see, I'm looking at your body language. <laughs> um, I can, I can, I'm trying to think if I can, of an example, um, you know, if, if I buy, you know, a product from Apple, I'm stuck with the way that that product works. If, I, if my son writes the software, I can say to him, hey, you know, I want it to do, I, I want it, uh, I can't even think of what it would be, but I want it to do something and he can just go in and change the software. He can't do that with an Apple product. So if somebody in the state's attorney's office, you know, doesn't like the wording of a particular event in the, in the software, in the case management, they can't, there's nobody they can just call up and say, hey, can you change that wording? I mean, there is a process for it, but PBK is a, is a commercial, you know, it has a lot of different clients and they have a whole system you have to go through to change anything. Whereas with your current system, you just call Monty Shop and say, hey, can you change that? And they can do it in two hours, depending on how, how easy or difficult it is. So that's what we're talking about when we need customization. Okay. I appreciate that. I, uh, I also think it's important to define configuration, configuration versus customization. And when we're talking about customization, as Alec and Monty are describing, it is about going into the code and customizing <coughs> the code. However, most, as I might actually say all, commercially available software um, typically is highly configurable. And what that typically means is even though the software itself is not being 
I do want to do that in a controlled fashion, of course, but uh, I just wanted to distinguish between configuration and customization. Even though we're saying you wouldn't customize the software, there, we, we expect and we know PDK pretty well that the county would have the ability to highly configure, configure the system to meet the business needs of the, uh, of the prosecutor's office as well as any interactions with uh, their justice partners. Commissioner Kersky. Okay, so first of all, I, I do really appreciate the involvement of so many people in this project. Um, the county has over 70 um, attorneys employed by us that half of them this will definitely benefit and make their life easier, that being our state's attorney's office. The other side is those 30 plus that belong to the public defender, public advocate. Change is never easy and if we can you know, use technology to um, improve our efficiencies, I'm, I'm all for it. You know, the, I guess the question that I'm trying to f formulate here is, is there a re end result staffing-wise? Will we save staff over here? Will we had to add, have to add staff over there? We're spending, I think we budgeted $300,000 or something for this. 200, 200. 250,000 for this product um, and that's great one t for the most part one time I'm sure there's licensing fees annually etc but the, the long-term implication is what does it do to our staff when, we're, when we have attorneys that we're paying eighty ninety thousand dollars a year on average um, you know and if we have to add three of them any savings has to be realized so I'm just wondering has, has that part really been looked at I'll answer that or give it a try, and then if Barry Dunn wants to, to try as well. And I think um, maybe we can let the help. state's attorney come yeah. and give his two cents worth as well. Yeah. I'll give my two cents. I typically don't try to um, try to justify personnel savings with software. It's a better tool. Does it mean that we don't need as many people? Um, probably not. Does it make us more efficient? Um, hopefully that's the intent, right? Um, Long term, is it possible with better tools we won't need as many people? Um, possibly, but trying to, to do the, figure out exactly how that equates is really, really hard. So, you know, I guess that, that's my opinion is I typically don't try to, to say that this software is gonna reduce the amount of staff that, that uh, the county needs. Um, is it gonna make us more efficient? Is it gonna be a better tool for us? Yes, that's the intent, so. Alec, do you have anything to add to that? I am gonna ask the state's attorney too to yeah. come, mm -hmm. or Doug. I had, a, uh, I had a small thing to add. I would agree with, uh, with Molly's um, assertion that uh, it's, it's um, atypical to uh, try to determine you know, staff reductions based on the implementation of software, although in certain circumstances that can be the case. What we have found is that, and it's not just with prosecution systems, it's with court systems and correctional systems and police systems, is that uh, staff who are doing mundane tasks today typically can be redirected to do more value-added activities uh, with inside your organization. So there may be some activities that are languishing today that, are, that can't be accomplished or accomplished in, a, uh, in an appropriate way because uh, those staff are working on mundane tasks that uh, the system or the current processes require. And the hope would be, and again, we'd have to try to quantify this at some point, but the hope would be to uh, determine what those mundane tasks are, eliminate those mundane tasks through the use of the new system, and uh, redirect those staff to provide more value-added activities. Thank you, Doug. Uh, State's Attorney, I have you on my list, so I think Thank it's you. an opportunity <laughs> for you to all, he, Daniel was the one that brought us this software idea, and we decided to dig into it. So I um, want to add to our briefing. Thank you, Daniel Hager, Minneapolis County State's Attorney. With regard to will this you know, save us X amount of dollars, I think that I agree with Monty and with Barry Dunn. That's hard to quantify. I do believe that this software will make um, everyone in the State's Attorney's Office more efficient. You know, when you're talking about 66 people working, if if we gain you know, a percentage of productivity, uh, that pays dividends. I do anticipate that this is going to slow my request for new attorneys. You know, so if I'm asking for a legal office assistant versus a, an attorney, you know, that's, 
thirty, fifty thousand dollars a year just in salary that um, you know we won't be paying. Right? I can't sit here and say uh, in two years crime is going to do this, so I'm not going to need an attorney. I do not anticipate standing up here in our next budget hearings asking for new attorneys. I think that this software is going to slow that. And I anticipate that starting hopefully this year as we get started on this. My office understands that this will be um, a heavy lift to change systems. I think they understand that there's going to be a year um, of hard work that's coming with this. Uh, my expectation for every single person in that office is that they embrace this. When I come in front of this commission and ask for investment into our office and investment into uh, public safety in Mahaha County, I mean it. And so this is not going to be a program where five years down the road we're looking at and saying, wow, uh, they're not using it. You know, I will make sure that they're accountable. They'll account be accountable to me and to you and to the citizens of Minneapolis County. So I look forward to this opportunity. I think it's a good thing for the office. I think it will help, um, you know, the 66 people there. That's a good thing for the community. I think that the court system and the defense attorneys benefit from organized prosecutors. There can be less resets in court, which has a saving. You know, the quicker that cases are resolved, um, that reduces backlog um, of further challenge. Additional comments for Thank Daniel? You. Thank you. And I, I, I think that I heard in this presentation from someone that there is a way that we're going to be able to work with the Public Defender's Office and Public Advocate's Office and, and take care of the concerns that they have. I'm not sure who would answer that, but I think that there's ways to, some, somebody in Minneapolis is already doing this, adding an additional part that would satisfy their concerns. Correct. Yeah, yes. that was the the um, interface that it discussed that would allow that document discovery to right. to flow from the state's attorney's office to the public defender and public advocate. Okay, mm -hmm. thanks, Monty. Commissioner Bender. So just to clarify, I mean, I think there had been some current concern initially that if this if the information came over differently, it might require hiring additional legal assistance or, you know, somebody to take on that additional work on, at the public advocate and public defender's office. And I think through the process, through the hard work that Monty particularly has done, um, we are comfortable that it's going to come over very similarly to how it comes right now. So it shouldn't require additional staff um, for the public defender and public advocate's office. That's at least what we, our, educa our education so far seems to indicate. I agree. You know, Jean Carroll and I were all part of that, um, part of that meeting, and I feel that we all got that uh, perception from that meeting, and with my follow-up uh, from another county, um, really got a comfort level, a reasonable level of confidence that we can bring those documents over to the public defender and public advocate's office in a pretty seamless fashion. Thanks, Monty. Any Commissioner Benegan? Uh, Monty, a couple of questions about when this software is introduced, how much time will it take to not only interface and process that to the new system, so to speak, but staff training, how much time will that take? Mm, uh, I'll answer that the best that I can, but I don't know the, the answer to that. One thing that I will say as far as IT staff goes, it's, it's not nearly as involved as projects, let's say 15 years ago. 15 years ago, a project like this, they'd say you need three Windows servers and they need to have these specs and all of this uh, infrastructure would have to be set up to support this. With PBK, it's a cloud-hosted system, right? So we, we don't set up anything um, as far as servers, operating systems, databases, we don't do any of that. That's all on PBK, right? So that workload, that um, that risk, that responsibility shifts to them and is part of our maintenance. Um, <clears throat> so the IT department's responsibility will be getting data to them so that they can do a database conversion. And the IT's responsibility will be um, working with them on those interfaces to make sure we can get the data elements that we need um, and the documents and get those interfaces to work. Um, you know, really, there's going to be a, a fair amount of lift as far as how do you want the system to work? How do you want tasks to, to flow from, you know, attorneys to paralegals or however that might work? You know, that's really going to be um, work on the state's attorney's office to work with PBK to 
configure the system how they want it configured. So they're probably going to have as, as much or more of a workload than we will. As far as training, I don't know how long training takes. You know, I saw the demo, it was two hours. I would anticipate, you know, it's going to be give or take two hours per employee to get them up to speed. But Daniel might have better insight on, on that than I do. Um, and PBK provides that training. So, and that was part of the price, if I recall correctly. Yep. Well, that was my next question. The other thing that, uh, quick question about, will the staff be able to use the software more user friendly, if you will, from home or? Um, the staff will be able to use the system from home uh, pretty natively. What I mean by that is right now, um, staff can with their tablet VPN in and they can launch their software and, and use it in that way. With PBK being a cloud-based system, you know, whether it's their home computer or what have you, they'll be able to go to the website, log in, and get to that case management system from, from anywhere. Well, some of the trends, obviously, through COVID and all the other things that we've dealt with is having staff that really wants to work from home or a portion of that, and one of the benefits may be, frankly, to be able to do that simpler and more electronically yep. friendly, if you will. Yeah, to do the rest of their job, they're still going to need to, to VPN in, right. you know, to um, be able to get into other applications, to watch videos, probably, probably is going to be a separate process, but... You know, it'll be easy for them to, to access it from home. And I've heard your uh, story about the, all the videos in the past, and I know how massive storage is for that. That's not going to ever go away. So we are going to have storage costs. There's no question about that. Correct. Yeah. So we will have storage costs, um, and we have had for give or take five years. Um, and I do the best to try to keep, you know, those costs down. Um, and we're doing a storage refresh this year, and there's going to be some costs associated with that. So I'm doing the best that I can to uh, try to find high-capacity um, disk that doesn't um, break the bank, um, yet is still enterprise class and um, reliable and um, all of those things. So we'll, we'll still have those challenges um, in parallel with this whole thing. The last question is going to be the obvious one is we're going to need to put together a budget for implementation usage, software cost, updates, licensing, all of those kinds of things. Is that something in the works? Um, so the uh, 2022 budget was approved with $250,000 for this project. Um, I I don't know if there would be a supplement required in order to do some of the interfaces. I think that amount is, is going to cover it or okay. be really close. So okay. budget-wise, I think that it's pretty close. Um, if there if there would be a supplement, I think it would be pretty small. Okay. Additional, Thank you. Additional questions? Commissioner I have, I have additional, but I'll give everybody else a chance first, if anybody else does. Nope. Okay. Um, this question, I guess, would be for Mr. Letty or Mr. Rowe. Uh, the, the size and scope of this project, um, typically I would think that you would probably want a project manager of sort on this. Is that a correct assumption? And it help walk us through that. management, a project manager who is 
exit to migrate existing data uh, over into the new system, development, design and development of the interfaces, all of those require uh, project management uh, prowess. And uh, you know, whether you contract that out or you, you have that, uh, that uh, skill set in-house, we highly encourage you to have a project manager to focus on that. I will point out that we do not have funding for a project manager built into that, that amount of money that we discussed. So that's probably a discussion we'll have when we bring this forward. A good question, um, whether we have the staffing to be that project manager or not. So um, that's something to be looking at. An FTE for probably six to eight months would probably be Marshall's or back. yeah, contract somebody. So I mean, that's yeah, definitely has to be considered. So, and, and if we're going to do this, let's do it right. Additional questions? <laughs> All right. I thank you, gentlemen, for joining us from Barry Dunn. Um, your information and your work has been very valuable to us as we continue to move forward on this. And I uh, anticipate that this will be on our agenda in the next few weeks to be looking at what we want to do. So, thank you for your time. <coughs> With that, we will move on to. Thank you. We'll move on to item number 21, which is a continued hearing for appeal on a decision by the Minnehaha County Planning Commission to approve conditional use permit number 21-76, allowing construction of a public utilities facility. I'm going to set down a few rules first. Um, we will have the proponent first, then the opponent, then the proponent will have an opportunity to rebuttal anything that's been said. Um, this is um, the commission can deny, uphold, <laughs> or um, amend. Or amend. That was the word I was looking for. Amend this decision. Um, we don't want to hear any information that was given last week. We have all those documents are on file in that book. They're on file in the auditor's office. They're online on MinnehahaCounty.org website. We have them up ahead. We've had all that conversation last week. So we would appreciate if you don't repeat things from last week. This continuation is specifically to talk about the briefings that we asked each side to write to us. And so, Kevin, I will let you go from there. Yes, and uh, I, I'm Kevin Hookman with the County Planning Department. Uh, yes, and I'll just briefly present the, the continuation. Uh, this item was heard first in December 21st of the County Commission meeting. It's an appeal of a uh, conditional use permit from the Planning Commission. Uh, at the December 21st meeting, uh, there is discussion about all aspects of the Planning Commission uh, uh, reviewed in all aspects of the project. Um, and there was a question about the classification of the uh, applicant as a public utility, uh, and at which time the uh, Commission uh, requested a continuation for the hearing to January 4th. Uh, commission meeting. And just remember, or a reminder that the Planning Commission heard this item on November 22nd, and that that meeting, it was approved unanimously uh, with the conditions that were presented uh, by the Planning Commission, and that is the appealed item that we are hearing. And as you stated, you can uh, amend, uphold, or uh, deny the Planning Commission's decision for this item. And I guess I'll move out of the way for the uh, everyone else, unless you have any questions. I don't think you have any questions now, and I will note that Commissioner Bender has recused herself from this item. So uh, we will start with the proponents, which would be uh, Northern Brightmark. Thank you, Chairperson Heiberger, Commissioners. My name is Jason Sutton. Um, here again on behalf of Northern Natural Gas, the applicant for this conditional use permit. I want to thank you again for your attention and time. Um, as you noted, Chairperson Heiberger, I don't intend to go into any of the substantive discussions that we did yesterday. I'm just talking about the law here today. So unless you have other questions, let me know, but that's where I'm going to focus my comments. So we step back. As much as um, you may not want me to, we have to walk through what do your ordinances actually say. And that's the briefing that you asked us. We've provided a brief as well as the briefing being that was provided by the opponents, the workuses in this matter. So let's start with the baseline. Um, what is this property currently zoned? Zoned A1. So when we go to those ordinances, then the question becomes, can we get a conditional use permit? 
And when you start peeling it, you get to 3.04W, and that says you can get a pup conditional use permit if it's a public utility facility. What does that mean? Okay, so now let's go to the definitions. And before I jump into the substantive defini definitions, I want to point something out to you that is at the very beginning of your definitional section of your ordinances. And this is incredibly important from my perspective. Definitions are in Article 26. 26.01 says, quote, any word not herein defined shall be defined in any recognized standard English dictionary. That's our gap filler, which is consistent generally with the law, um, which is you use the plain meaning of the language. So if we can't find a specific spot in the ordinances saying this word means this, how do we figure out what it means? Well, what we do is we go to the dictionaries. Okay, so that's our overarching principle. Now, we start walking into the terms that are defined. And this gets a little circular, so bear with me, but it's important. Um, remember, back under Article 3, it had to be a public utility facility. Three words here, not just public utility. Public utility facility is the def defined term for the conditional use permit. That is then defined in section 560 in the definitions. This is where it gets circular. I kind of like this. Quote, the definition is the same as neighborhood utility facility, except buildings that exceed 120 square feet and roof are allowed. Okay, so now we've got to go to neighborhood utility facility. Section 480. And this is where the proverbial rubber hits the road. So here's what your ordinances, which have been approved by the commissions previously and which you are required to follow, defines a neighborhood utility facility. Telephone, electric and cable television lines, poles and equipment, Water or gas pipes, mains and valves, so the pipeline clearly is permitted. Um, sewer pipes and valves or telephone, there's a bunch of things in the middle that don't matter, and then you get down to the catch-all at the end. All other facilities and equipment, open parentheses, excluding buildings that exceed 120 feet of roof area, that's why you don't need a conditional use permit until the roofs get bigger than 120, because it's a permissive use. Necessary for conducting a service by a government or a public utility. So here's where the arguments all come around. The workuses could not reasonably argue to you that the pipes themselves are not authorized as a conditional use water or gas pipes, it's directly in there. So then the question becomes is, do the additional buildings above create a problem or is that something necessary for conducting a service by a government or a, two words, public utility? Not public utility facility, that matters. That's defined in your ordinances. Public utility isn't. So now we go back to our gap filler. What's the gap filler? What do the definitions say? And we provided you several in our brief. You cut through it. Utilities require essentially two main things. They're highly regulated by the government and everyone gets access to it. That's what we call open access. Northern natural gas. The evidence is there, the certificate. The reality is, is natural gas is one of the most highly regulated industries in the United States. It's regulated by the federal government here, FERC, as well as the Pipeline and Hazardous Safety Materials Administration. The federal government's looking everywhere. So that's requirement one. Is it regulated by the government? Requirement two, is it open? Is it generally a service that's provided to everybody? The answer is yes. Anybody that can connect, can transport 
gas down the pipeline. You got to connect. The federal government just doesn't let you tie in. You got to make sure it's safe. But we can't say no to anybody. And just as important, here's where the regulation comes in. We don't get to tell people what we charge. The federal government does through the approved tariff, all of which is laid out in your brief. That's the or in the briefing we gave you. That overarching matters because that's what makes northern natural gas a utility. That's why it's different than Boyce Law Firm. I get to decide as a lawyer, do I want to represent a client or not? And I get to decide whether what I want to charge. Utilities don't get those choices. The government says anybody that we approve connecting, you have to transport it, and here's what you get to charge. And because of that, there are certain things that come into play. But those are the definitions of a utility from the dictionaries all over the place we provided to you. That establishes the requirement that natural gas, which makes sense. Let's not forget, this isn't, we're not recreating the wheel here. This is a natural gas transport transmission company. Um, gas is what we think of when we think of utilities. All feed that definition. So now, let's flip to what the workuses are telling you. I would submit it's misdirection. But let, let's step back. So they took a brief that was filed before the South Dakota Public Utilities Commission. Um, and interestingly, I would note in their briefing to you, all they did is rehash the same argument that they had when we showed up here two weeks ago. And they took quotes out of that document, and they were very selective in quoting out of context to argue to you, while Northern says they're not a public utility. And because they've said that to the South Dakota Public Utilities Commission, um, there's no way they can be a public utility under your ordinances. And here's the misdirection. I will admit, in that brief, Northern argued to the South Dakota Public Utilities Commission, it is not a public utility for purposes of being regulated by the state of South Dakota. Think about this. Those are the statutes that apply for when the PUC has the authority under 4934A, their regulatory power. They get to regulate the utilities that are within the confines of the state of South Dakota. That authority does not exceed and their jurisdiction does not exceed once those utilities go across state lines. But under their own statutory framework, it says, okay, we've got to define what we the PUC can regulate. And that's in chapter 4934A, it's described in our briefing. Um, and excluded from that is inter cross state lines, pipelines. Um, that entire farm tap case, when you really dive down into it, and it's in the brief that they provided with theirs, it's ask the questions. What happened there is Northwestern Energy had decided that it no longer wanted to provide service to farm tap owners like the workuses. And they said, we're not gonna do this anymore. And importantly, Northern, because of federal law, couldn't sell the gas. We transport it. We can't sell it to someone direct. And because of that, the PUC said, well, we got a problem. We got 197 people who aren't going to be able to heat their homes um, because Northwestern isn't going to do this anymore. And we got to figure out who in the world's going to do this. And we have this big legal question. And, and what it was, was the PUC staff went to the PUC and said, hey, we need a declaration. We need you to decide the law here. Who can we? Re who is a utility for your regulation? Northwestern, Northern, and who can we make deliver this gas, if anybody? That was the question. And, and so trying to take that issue regarding the definitions under the PUC and the statements there about jurisdiction to argue that Northern has agreed it's not a public utility for purposes of your ordinance, a completely different statute, a different jurisdiction, is just square peg round hole. It's like saying that because someone was prosecuted as an adult at 16, 
that they are not a minor, and as a result, they can enter into a contract. Minor means different things in different statutes. It's the same thing. Public utility means different things in different statutes. And here, I would submit, is the ultimate reflection of the fallacy in their argument. Let's take this to the logical conclusion. We walked through in our brief. It's undisputed that if Northern Natural Gas's line stopped a foot from the Nebraska border, it would be, and let's just say it was only in South Dakota. Everything else is the same. The pipe's the same. The eight buildings are the same. Everything else is the same. It's an intrastate pipeline at that point. It's undisputed that it is a public utility under 4934A, the PUC, and under the Workus's argument, it would be undisputed that it's a public utility under your ordinances. So we get the conditional use permit. Legally, it's not an issue. Now, that pipe goes an extra two feet and crosses state lines. The impact on Minnehaha County residents is exactly the same. Pipes are the same, the buildings are the same, there is zero impact. But under their argument, just because that pipe went two feet further and is now regulated by the federal government instead of the state government, you no longer can issue a conditional use permit. And oh, by the way, there's no gap filler anywhere else in the ordinances. If they're right, this can't happen, is their argument. That's an illogical reading of your own ordinances. The reality is, what makes sense is, what is Northern? It is a utility regulated by the federal government and as a consequence satisfies the definitions and a conditional use permit is proper. Um, so that's my long way of walking through the quote, what is a public utility today? But um, unless you have any additional questions for me, those are the comments I have. Are there any questions for Mr. Sutton? Thank you. Thank you. And we'll go to the opponents um, for the workuses. Mr. Almond. Well, Here there are I think Mr. Taylor may have oh, some comments. Oh, excuse me. Okay, is there someone from the proponents that would like to speak first? Sorry. <clears throat> Thank you, commissioners. William Taylor representing Breitmark. With all deference to Commissioner Karski, I'm not an octogenarian, I'm a septuagenarian. <laughs> the advantage that that offers is I'm old enough to remember when there wasn't public natural gas in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, when my grandparents heated their house with coal. When the house they built in 1946 was the first house in the north quadrant of Sioux Falls on Euclid Avenue that had a solely gas-fired furnace. The regulation of natural gas in the United States has the most colorful history of almost anything next to the regulation of the railroads. 1933, the first gas act was passed because of the abuses by the gas companies in the provision of natural gas intrastate and interstate. The concept of the federal government was simple. You know, in our Constitution, there's a clause called the Supremacy Clause, Constitution of the United States. And it says that if the federal government chooses to regulate some form of human behavior, if the government's regulation is so pervasive that it preempts the field, then Federal regulation is exclusive. The political fight in the 30s was who gets to regulate intrastate, who gets to regulate interstate natural gas. The outcome, <clears throat> Congress said the states will regulate intrastate production of natural gas, production and distribution, the federal government will regulate interstate. Why was that? Sioux Falls, South Dakota, the early natural gas production in Sioux Falls, coal-based, railroads brought coal into town. There was a coal gasification plant where Fawick Park is today, where the Statue of David is located, where coal was converted to natural gas. And the city of Sioux Falls franchised a gas company that sold natural gas throughout the city. 
intrastate, regulated by the state of South Dakota. Northern natural gas, there's one other step. After the first Gas Act was passed, companies like Northern could be both in the wholesale and retail business. So they could build their pipeline from Texas to Michigan with a branch into South Dakota, and they could sell retail in South Dakota. 1978, Congress said there's still too many abuses in this system, so we're going to do that in. You either have to be an interstate wholesale transporter or you have to be a distributor. Warren Buffett figured all that out. He owns MidAmerica, that is the principal distributor, public utility in South Dakota, and he owns Northern, the Northern Pipeline System, that is the principal interstate pipeline. So, I like Mr. Allman, he's a clever guy. He probably followed the farm tap debate just like I followed the farm tap debate. I told you last time I've been in the pipeline business since the 70s. We followed the farm tap debate because we represent TransCanada who operates the, the Keystone Pipeline, crude oil pipeline that runs border to border through South Dakota and interstate public utility regulated by FERC and FIMSHA and the northern border gas pipeline that runs from Gary, comes into South Dakota at Gary and goes out of South Dakota up by Aberdeen, interstate natural gas pipeline regulated by FERC and FIMSHA. The farm tap deal. In the 30s and 40s, when the natural gas pipelines were constructed interstate, one of the inducements to the farmers to allow an easement to go across their property was, we'll let you hook up to the natural gas pipeline. Workuses are hooked up to this pipeline. Their, I think Mrs. Workus said her grandfather signed the easement that got the natural gas farm tap. So, I told you in 1978 they had to separate retail from wholesale. Northern sold its retail processes to a company from Minnesota who a few years later sold it to Northwestern Energy Company, who we know about, the, who is an electrical company and gas retail company in South Dakota, used to be headquartered in the old phone company building after they moved down here from Huron. With the sale, Northern sold the obligation to service the farm taps. But it was never clear in South Dakota law who had the obligation to maintain the pipe from Northern's line to the farmhouse. Well, under the contract, Northwestern had to maintain them, and they said a few years ago, we're sick of doing this. We're not going to do it anymore. We're we can't make any money at it. And there was a big turmoil, and the Public Utilities Commission had this proceeding that the brief comes out of. The Public Utilities Commission, one of the ideas that was put before the commission was, well, we'll make Northern maintain them if Northwestern's not going to do it. And Northern said, Northern's not a public utility defined by South Dakota law, Northern is under the exclusive jurisdiction of FERC and therefore is not subject to the South Dakota PUC's jurisdiction. That's what this brief is all about. It's not about is Northern a public utility, it's about is Northern a public utility regulated by the South Dakota PUC. The connection that Breitmark proposes and the northern facility meets your statutory, your ordinances definitions exactly. It is a public, northern is a public utility. The small area in which they ask to make this interconnection point is a public utility facility. By anybody's definition, dictionary, federal law, 
or state law, Northern qualifies as a public utility. So Northern qualifies for a CUP. And I appreciate your vote in that favor. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any more proponents since I missed it last time? Okay, then we'll go to the opponents. Mr. Almond. Good morning and happy new year, commissioners. My name is Reese Almond with the Davenport Evans Law Firm on behalf of the Workuses. In thinking about this morning's hearing, or meeting, a uh, saying that I've seen a lot of kept popping into my mind, and that is, when someone tells you who they are, believe them the first time. And that's, that applies here. The issue here is whether or not Northern is a public utility. Well, you only need to look at Northern's own words to answer that question. We've presented you with the preceding filing that Northern filed with our state when about 200 landowners that were hooked up to a farm tap system were asking Northerns for Northern's help and saying, please provide us gas. When asking our state to help them get that gas, Northern said, I can't help you. We are not a public utility. We are not a public utility as defined by South Dakota law. Sorry, we are a natural gas company, not a public utility. Fast forward five years, now that Northern wants something from the county that requires them to be a public utility, suddenly we're a public utility now. Um, never mind what we said to the state of South Dakota five years ago. We are now a public utility. We want this conditional use permit. And they're trying to walk back their prior admissions to the state of South Dakota. Uh, the most pointed ones, I just want to re-quote, found on page 14. Northern is not a public utility as defined by SDCL 49-34A-1 subpart 12. That's the statute in South Dakota that defines public utility. Uh, also on page 14, Northwestern is a public utility as defined by that statute and Northern is not. The South Dakota PUC previously found that Northern is not a public utility. And turning to page 16 of that brief, in summary, Northwestern is a public utility and Northern is not. And you just heard from Mr. Sutton and Mr. Taylor today again, admitting that Northern is not a public utility for purposes of South Dakota law, which is where I will remind the commission, which I'm sure you're all aware of, is counties in South Dakota are nothing but creatures of South Dakota state statute. Well, if you're nothing but a creature of South Dakota state statute, South Dakota law applies to you as a county. So their admissions that Northern is not a public utility under South Dakota law applies equally to this county proceeding that requires it to be a public utility. And for that reason, a conditional use permit for a public utility facility cannot be issued to an entity that is not a public utility under South Dakota law. And really, there's, a, there's a, a clean, easy way to handle this issue, really. If the county decides that, hey, we want to issue conditional use permits for this type of project for a natural gas company, it just needs to amend its ordinances. It just needs to say, we'll issue a public utility facility to governments, public utilities, and natural gas companies, done. They can then reapply, they can come get this permit. The ordinances will clearly allow for it and permit it. But until then, the commission is obligated to follow the ordinances and what they say. And the ordinances require that an applicant for a public utility facility be a public utility. And Northern has now admitted again today that it is not a public utility under South Dakota law. So for that reason, I'd request that you deny this permit. And if you want this project to go forward, just amend the ordinances to allow a natural gas company to apply for this type of permit. That's the clean, easy solution. So unless you have any questions for me, I will uh, not take up any more of your time. And I certainly appreciate your attention this morning. Thank you. Any questions <clears throat> for Mr. Allman? Are there anyone else? Oh, Commissioner Karski. I guess since we're 
you're up here as the opponent to this, and with the whole argument of public utility, et cetera, aside, I guess I'd like to know from the opponent's perspective, when we look at the structures that'll be here, and we've talked about insulation, size, color, shape, et cetera, would there be anything within that perspective that would change the opponent's um, opposition to this? What would they like to see if this, if they could help design this? I, I think the, the primary concern, and David can, can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the, the, the primary concern is the noise component of it. If there could be some condition put on the noise that reaches the Verkus's home from this facility, I think that would go a long way of, of making them um, some concession. Swallow this project and, 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 and palatable. Mm -hmm. um, we heard at the last meeting that there was uh, 70 decibels was projected from the facility. Um, you know, you think about 70 decibels in your window in a quiet spring, fall, summer night when you're trying to sleep. That terrifies them. They, they like sleeping with their windows open. They like living in a nice, quiet, rural community. So it's really that, that decibel concern, the sound of this facility. And certainly they were pleased about the, the aesthetics that is being proposed and the landscaping. It looked great. Hopefully it is as good as their, their schematics show. So assuming that's the case, really it's the sound is the biggest concern that they have. So if there's some sort of condition that could be placed on this project that would not allow a certain level of sound uh, at the residence of the Fergus, so not even the property line, but at their residence. Um, I guess I would propose a 25 decibel limit, but uh, I'm not a sound engineer. I just know 25 decibels is, is, is about a whisper, which I think when you're trying to sleep, hopefully you can't hear that whisper. But Thank you. I don't know if the property know, owner. Yeah. Okay. Thank is, you. I, I think maybe this is for Kevin. Is the decimal level, I'm not sure who answers this, is the decimal level to the edge of the property line? Is it to the edge of the trees? Is it to the workers' house? What, where was that decimal level measured to? Because Kevin? Kevin, probably. Thank you. So, so in the original permit, there actually is no provision about noise. So if you wanted to create a condition for noise, you can uh, create a decimal level to the nearest residence or to the property line, kind of wherever your direction would be. All right. Thanks, Kevin. Yep. Uh, Mr. Ullman, I didn't mean to cut you off. I just wanted to answer my question. Are there any other questions for Mr. Ullman? Boss Commissioner Barth. Um, is there anyone else that wants to speak on the opponent side? And give the proponents an opportunity to rebuttal anything that was said if they would like. Thank you again, Chairperson Heiberger. I, I'm going to be very brief. I want to respond to two comments from Mr. Allman as well as the issue raised by Mr. Karski's question. Um, starting with the law side, I just want to be clear. What you never heard here was any explanation as to your ordinances why this is not a public utility. They want to argue about state statute. You got a lot of defined terms in your ordinances. One of them is a vehicle. I can guarantee you, vehicles defined in SDCL several spots just because it meets a definition of one spot for one statute under South Dakota state law doesn't mean it's a vehicle in your definitions. It's square peg, round hole. And, they, and he didn't respond to that because there is no response. I mean, that, that's just the law and that's the way it is. I do want to address the sound issue raised by Mr. Karski with your permission in light of this fact. Um, <coughs> somewhat similar to the question that you raised, Chairperson Heiberger, at the last meeting, what you heard was that at the edge of the fence, okay, not even the, not even the workers' property, the fence, because I would remind you their property, even at the line, is across the road, then the house is another 500 feet approximately in total from the fence. 
it's 70 decibels. Um, that's vacuuming a um, floor, essentially. Now, Mr. Ullman tells you, well, let's go to 25 decibels of whisper. I'm not an engineer. I don't even, I didn't even stay at a Holiday Inn Express last night and I don't play one. Um, what I do know is that people that are a lot smarter than me tell me that trying to measure sound at that house is a, a very difficult issue. It's affected by what crops are growing, which way is the wind blowing, a bunch of things. So I want to tell you that one of the concerns from the project is that if you set a noise condition at their house, that may be very difficult to enforce or comply with, both sides. And we're just building the next fight because, we, because it requires testing. Um, the testing can, be, can depend on when, where, um, is that peak, is that audible? I mean, there's a whole slew of variables that people that are way smarter than me said, whoa, slow down. That, that sounds really great in theory, but then the smart people say it's a problem. The other thing I would tell you, and this gets further complicated in the law, I would submit for the supremacy clause reasons that were raised by Mr. Taylor, you don't have jurisdiction to do so. You start getting into deciding the conditions. Um, noise gets very close to safety. Safety, as it relates to a interstate pipeline, is exclusively within the jurisdiction of the Pipeline Safety and Hazardous Materials Act, the federal government. You also run into issues of whether it's within the exclusive by setting the condition, when FERC said that we have the ability to do this, have you stepped on FERC's toes and exceeded their jurisdiction? None of that's before you today, but I'm just telling you that if you start proceeding down those additional conditions, which were not addressed by the planning and zoning, there's a whole can of worms that potentially get opened up. Um, and I go back to, let's stop and think about common sense. It's 500 feet. I get it. I grew up in five acres uh, outside of Watertown. Um, I had my windows open. I also heard crickets and bullfrogs every night. I mean, it's 500 feet, and it is 70 decibels at the loudest at their own, at our fence, with trees, is a vacuum cleaner. How many of you can hear a vacuum cleaner over a football field and a third? That's the question. So I, we would ask on behalf of Northern that you approve the conditional use permit with the conditions as identified by planning and zoning. Thank you. Madam Chair. Uh, yeah, don't leave yet, yeah. Commissioner Brown. Go ahead. Uh, oh, I, I had a question. I think, I think last week when we talked about this as an intermittent, it's not a continuous, and is it a generator, and is the generator just run when necessary as a backup, or is it a continuous? It is not continuous. I think there are a couple of components. Um, one is the generator, and, and one is, you know, there may be a compressor as well that it's intermittent. I, this is the technical aspect of this. I may defer to Mr. Taylor, because he, I think, has a better understanding of that nuance. Um, but that is my understanding as well, Chairperson Heiberger. It, it is certainly not a consistent noise. So, it, and I do, I mean, it was both, um, the primary, the loudest point, I think, is the generator, which is, a, you know, a backup generator. Okay. Madam Chair. Commissioner Karski. If I could, I think Mr. Taylor is itching to get up there. And I did ask that question last week or two weeks ago, whatever it was, is it a continuous or intermittent? And he said it is intermittent and that um, they would be willing to do what they could on a reasonable basis to insulate the buildings to reduce that. And I just would like you to talk to that also if you are going to be up, Mr. Taylor. First of all, I'm moderately handicapped today because my consulting engineer is stuck in I think he said St. Lucia with COVID. <laughs> Poor guy. And 
doesn't matter because there's no airplane connections anyway because everything's been canceled. To your question, my understanding is, is that there's a compressor, there's a pop-off valve. The loudest feature in the facility is the pop-off valve. So if there's an overpressure event, the pop-off valve opens and releases the pressure, and that's the 70 dB issue. Okay. So there's a compressor. There's a backup generator. If the power fails, the backup generator comes on to run the compressor to avoid the overpressure event, to avoid the pop-off valve mm -hmm. going off. And 70 dB is the is the uh, pop-off. Pop okay. Measured at the fence. The fence is surrounded by trees and bushes, and then 500 feet of passage. So in anticipation of this issue, last time we were here, I looked up variable noise levels. Workus has pro uh, proposed a 25 dB noise level. 30 dB is a human whisper. 60 to 70 dB is normal conversation or hens clucking. I didn't write this, so I don't know why somebody chose hens clucking. 76 dB is what you hear inside a tractor with a closed cab. So that gives you a parameter of what we're talking about. I do know this, that noise attenuates with distance and terrain. For example, that's pasture land between the workers' house and 248th Street. And there's a creek that runs through there that has some trees in it. We went out and looked at it the other day. All of those features tend to attenuate the noise along with distance, wind, humidity, air pressure, and it's different. Uh, uh, sunlight plays a role also, although I can't explain why. So. The prospects of a noise disruption at the workers' house, very small. Thank you. Any additional questions? Any other? The question about insulation. Oh, yes. My understanding is, is that the reason that the buildings are built around the compressor is, and the other features, number one is to protect them from weather, and number two is they're all insulated for sound protection. But the pop-off valve is not because it's outside. So the buildings are already insulated, and the 70 decibels is considered within that insulation? At the fence. At the fence. Yeah. OK. Thank you. And if you want to hear from my engineer, I think I can get him on the phone. It might no. be touch and go. But That's OK. Commissioner Byrne. I think uh, uh, Commissioner uh, Karski was wise in asking this question because what can be made, uh, what can be done to make it more palatable to the neighbors? And if the noise is the issue, I'm sure there are some things. Uh, and I will say that I once lived on 57th Street here in, in, uh, in Minnehaha County on the north side of the street. And uh, occasionally motorcycle enthusiasts would uh, go past my house in groups, I once counted 80 of them. And they were doing wheelies and roaring away. Anyway, I put in a, a privacy fence, only six foot tall, but it deflected that noise somewhat away. The vegetation didn't do as much, I don't feel, to, uh, to block the noise or, or dissipate it. But uh, I think uh, I would urge the proponents to uh, work with the uh, uh, workuses to see what might be done uh, reasonably to uh, placate them or remove some of their concerns. And it might be that after a few months of operation that 70 dB at the border of that property is completely uh, not an issue. But it might be that they would still like some more to be done. Anyway, uh, thank you, Mr. Karski, for your comments. I have a question for Kevin.
Yes. How many tree rows do we have? We do have a plan. Let's see if we can find them. A little further down. I think it's all the way at the end. It's in there. There it is. There it is. So uh, it looks to be about two rows through most of it, um, and with uh, one row on either side, east and west, so from that map. Okay. Thank you. I think we are done with proponent and opponent um, testimonies, and we will now look for a decision from the commission. If you have any further questions to ask, otherwise, we'd look for a decision. Commissioner Kursky. If I could, Madam Chair, I talk a lot about property rights, and property rights are always subject to um, conditions that are put by government, whether it be zoning, et cetera, conditional uses. You know, We've heard the arguments in the appeal, and we've reviewed all the, the materials um, submitted by everybody, and I would like to make a motion uh, pursuant to 1906 of our 1990 revised zoning ordinance that we amend one of the options that we have, the decision of the Planning Commission as follows, that the application be approved under 3.04X, which is public utility facility, of our ordinance, um, let me make, yeah, yeah, that, I'm sorry, 304X, which is agriculturally related operations involving the handling, storage, and shipping of farm products versus um, 304W, which is a public utility facility. So uh, that would be my motion that we amend it to be covered under this condition of use permit of 304X. Of our ordinance. I, I would second that motion and I'm ready to discuss it. I have a motion and a second. Um, we'll have planning and zoning a comment from them. Uh, Scott Anderson, planning director. I just want a clarification on the motion if that includes the conditions that were approved. Subject to all the conditions yep. that were yes. by the planning commission. Correct. Just want to yep. make sure that's in there. Thank yep. you. Yep. yep. And if I could, if additional First comments thing, on yep. there. And you know, what we're talking about here is methane, a, pro a byproduct of a dairy operation, definitely fr um, from the nutrients that cattle produce, and we're shipping it through a pipeline. So, I mean, it's hard to argue that this is not um, a farm product. So, based on that, I think it makes sense to put it under this condition versus public utility um, facility. And it is the um, right of the commission to amend, deny, or uphold the planning commission. And so we are amending what the planning commission did, and we are upholding the conditions that they had set forward with whatever the conditions were after that. Is it understood by all the commission? Okay, then I would ask for a roll call vote. Karski. Aye. Barth. Aye. Benega? Aye. Hi, Aye. Motion passes four to zero with the abstention of Commissioner um, Bender. With that, we'll move on to item number 22, legislative update by Tyler Platt. Good morning, Tyler Platt, Commission Office. Um, the legislative session begins on January 11th. The following bill highlights some items of interest for Minnehaha County. Um, as this update is before the session actually starts, there's not much to say about it beyond the text of the legislation. Um, future reports will include committee actions and assignments, those sorts of things. The bill itself is House Bill 1001 to revise the freeze on assessments for dwellings of disabled and senior citizens. I won't read the details for you unless we want to talk about them. I would just highlight that this legislation is part of the Sioux Falls and Minnehaha County Joint, County Joint Legislative Priorities and the South Dakota Association of County Commission uh, resolutions, rather. Are there any questions for Tyler? We will be probably having weekly legislative updates from now on. Yep. 
Seeing none, we will thank move you. on to, thank you, Tyler, to commission liaison reports. Are there any reports? No reports. I think this new year will probably get busy now. We were probably all out enjoying ourselves. We have, instead of doing old business and new ac business, I noticed that we are now going to be do, doing non-action commission discussion. Commissioner Barth, I think you mentioned that you wanted to say something about bills. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. And, uh, <laughs> you know, in the bills this week, uh, there was actually a couple of hospital bills, uh, one dating back to 2007. And some of these bills, uh, there was one in 2009 for $38,000. Uh, we pay pennies on the dollar on these hospital bills. At the same time, there's uh, uh, strong discussions between the hospitals and us. It's been a few years, but one year both hospitals sued us for $30 million. And the people need to understand, and that's often why I talk about these bills, that hospitals absorb some of these costs. And other costs of indigent health care are paid for by us representing the taxpayer. So just because we don't have Medicaid expansion doesn't mean it's not costing us either in our hospital bills or in our property taxes. So if I may, I would also say that on an anecdotal basis, uh, Pennington County uh, said they had an indigent burial that they paid for, and a week later a $6,000 headstone was placed on the grave. And that's the kind of thing we want to avoid. And our staff does a great job of saying, if you can't pay for it, who can? And it's so important. Uh, finally, I will say that uh, I don't speak on every single item. I had to hold myself back some tonight. But, uh, uh, and our votes are not always unanimous. And we might vote for something for different reasons, but today we were pretty uh, united in, in almost every single issue. And uh, I'm, I'm surprised to see, or I'm happy to see that Commissioner Karski has gained in wisdom now that he's back at, at a regular commissioner <laughs> spot. Are there any other non-action commission discussion? I would note that on Thursday there is a legislative breakfast and I believe some of us are attending. Um, it's like at seven o'clock in the morning. So Madam do we- Chair, I do want to say one more thing. Yep. We have uh, uh, Joe Kipley and uh, uh, Teresa Pesky uh, have sat here through this whole, I almost said damn meeting, but I don't wanna say damn <laughs> in public. Um, anyway, sat here through this whole meeting. Thank you two for hanging out here. And of course we've got uh, Nicole and Dave, but they are on the, on the job. So, um, with that, um, Carol, do we have exec session? Yes. Okay, then I would look. Um, I would look for a motion to recess for ten minutes, um, to re to re come back for um, next session. Second. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Motion passes unanimously. What did you need, Teresa?